I'd like to start the questions a part of our session today with Dr. Mustafa Bashir. So if you have any question, uh, please um, uh, please uh, write it to me and I'm going to direct it to Dr. Bashir. And Molly sequences, uh, modified lock locker inversion recovered sequences uh, for the analysis of these niche patients. So while it is quite straightforward for me to understand the role of uh, the multi echo, multi echo sequences uh, for PDFF calculation, I was wondering uh, which is the role of uh, of these other sequences if you uh, think these are useful and which is your current standard protocol for niche patients. Dr. Bashir, Federica, you thanks please, for your question. Can you, be, can, you, can you please repeat the question for everyone again, please? Sure. So, um, so uh, Federica was asking about the standard protocol for assessment of patients and to talk a little bit about the role of ideal sequences and MOLLE sequences, which, um, which we do in clinical trials and we're sometimes asked to do uh, by our, our clinical colleagues. Um, so the ideal sequence is, uh, is one of the variants of uh, liver fat quantification. And in fact, it's, uh, it's one of the, the original and best validated ones. Um, if you're using uh, GE scanners, this is the one that's supplied by, uh, by the vendor. It will be based on, on the ideal sequence. Um, and so it's, it's an accurate way of, of measuring uh, liver fat. If you want to measure liver fat, it's a great way to do it. Um, the MOLLE sequence is used to measure uh, T1. And T1 it has been shown in some studies to be correlated with, uh, with other findings in the liver. If you read the, the literature carefully, it's a little bit heterogeneous because it's been uh, suggested as a biomarker of hepatic fibrosis. It's been suggested as a biomarker of NASH overall, and it's been suggested as a biomarker of inflammation. Um, and there are, just as there are papers that show that uh, T1 is a reasonable measure um, of either fibrosis or inflammation, there are also papers that show um, that it does not work that well. Um, and of, of course, the challenge is that not everybody is doing T1 in the same way. It may be that, you know, in with some parameters or some techniques, it, it works well, and with others, it does not. Um, I think the, the story of, of the MOLLE sequences and T1 measurements for uh, measuring um, NASH and liver fibrosis is still an ongoing story. Um, for, for me personally, I'm not comfortable um, making a statement about the severity of liver fibrosis or the presence or absence of NASH uh, based on a, a T1 measurement because the data are still pretty heterogeneous. Again, there are some papers that show that this works and some papers that show that it, it doesn't work. Um, T1 got a lot of attention in the hepatology uh, community starting about five years ago. Um, it was it was commercialized and there was a lot of excitement about it. It got incorporated into a number of trials and um, and I think they saw for themselves that the results were somewhat heterogeneous. And so now some of the interest is is waning. There's still some interest, um, you know, from from some uh, some hepatologists and from some uh, drug companies in this. But then otherwise others are are looking at the data and saying, well, we're not sure that this works. Um, so I think the jury is still out. Uh, as far as how valuable the T1 measurement might might be. In terms of a standard protocol for assessing um, NASH patients, um, we we don't currently do clinical measurements of uh, of liver fat outside of the clinical trial settings. Uh, and it's simply because um, our hepatologists don't know what to do with the number. Um, as I mentioned before, the PDFF number doesn't tell you whether they have uh, better or worse NASH. Uh, it doesn't tell you whether going, they're going to do better or worse down the road um, until some of these treatments come online uh, and we're using um, PDFF to follow the patients. Uh, we're currently not using it as a, uh, as a diagnostic tool. So I hope that answered the, the question and uh, I don't know if you have a, a follow-up or if that answered it. Yes, perfect. Thank you. 
you thank you very much Rika, thank you. for being with us and thank you dr bashir for answering the question the second question is from argentina dr diego hipperman diego yes hello hello good afternoon Hi, everyone. You? thank you very much my question with you to you is how is maradona and messi are they doing okay uh, they're they are very fine i like a little more maradona but both of them are great so <laughs> great. <laughs> better better than Pele. No, great so you so, can give your question uh, please yes i would like i would like to ask because some publication proposed uh, in mri elastography a uh, first hole of 3.5 kilopascal just to differentiate a uh, nash from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease so i'd like to know what's the opinion of, uh, of dr mustafa mm. Thank you. So, um, so we don't use MR elastography for that, but it's for a different reason than liver fat, um, and it's it's for a workflow reason. Um, in our practice, our hepatologists have a fibro scan uh, in their clinic. They have a couple of devices, and so um, patients typically get a fibro scan scan assessment, and they use that as their assessment of fibrosis, uh, and they don't get that done in in MRI. Um, that being said, the um, so the the use of of uh, MRI elastography for the diagnosis of NASH, um, I think it has a stronger case in the literature than does the the T1 measurements. Um, different thresholds have been proposed. Um, some prefer the 2.9 or 3 threshold uh, that tells you not about NASH specifically, but tells you about hepatic fibrosis in general. Um, and they so they make a clinical assessment for NASH. And then the question is simply, do they have fibrosis or not? As opposed to, I have this patient, I'm not sure if they have NASH. Um, here is, you know, here's my MRE number. So those are two slightly different different scenarios. Um, if if you're already confident that they have a clinical diagnosis of NASH, you may be able to use a slightly lower threshold uh, of around three. If you're not sure uh, about the clinical assessment, then a little bit higher threshold is probably reasonable because uh, you, you're probably catch, capturing a lot of patients uh, who don't have um, any liver disease, uh, and the you know the variability in their measurements uh, means you need to to use a little bit higher threshold. Um, so that's a little bit of a roundabout answer, but I, I hope I've answered answered your question. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Khaled and Mustafa, this is Claude. Do you mind if I uh, say something? Uh, no, of course. I usually mind, but it's okay now. I don't mind, Dr. Sorlan. Thank you. Very <laughs> uh, well, first of all, Mustafa, that was just a, an absolutely beautiful lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, really entertaining and educational, very, very clear, despite the complexity of what you were discussing. Um, one thing I just want, I wanted to emphasize something that Mustafa just said that's really, really important. Um, and it has to do with the pretest probability of disease. Um, if you have a patient in whom the pretest probability of, say, advanced fibrosis or something like that is low, uh, but the test, whether the test is MR elastography or corrected T1 or something else, is 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 positive, um, then there's still a very good chance the patient does not have the disease. In other words, uh, the positive predictive value of a positive test is actually pretty modest if the pretest probability is low. So be very cautious in using some of these non-invasive tests to diagnose disease. Uh, if the patient does not have a high underlying risk for severe disease, and the test says they may have severe disease, it's very likely that it's a false positive. So please be very cautious in applying these tests to establish the diagnosis of the disease. As Mustafa just said, you may want to use a different threshold. You might want to use a higher threshold uh, to rule in disease if, in fact, the patient is not at very high risk uh, to begin with. Otherwise, you might make some big mistakes. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Uh, and I hope uh, maybe Mustafa explained it more clearly than I did, in which case I'm sorry if I made it more murky, but but I think he made a very important point. I just wanted to emphasize it. Thank you very much, Claude. I think this was also um, 
a very clear and uh, concise addition so thank you very much for uh, your comment so uh, any one of our colleagues here have a question Mustafa, do you want to add uh, a comment before we uh, conclude this session? This was a very good session and very concise and uh, to the point. And uh, the, the lecture was very clear and educational, and yet it has uh, the, the cutting edge research of, of this topic. So thank you very much for that. Would you like to add any anything before we uh, conclude? Uh, thank you, Khaled. Um, and thanks again for the invitation to speak. I'll, I'll add one last comment if I can. I think that um, a lot of the emphasis in the literature has really been on how uh, to do these measurements. And now I think it's very important that we shift our thinking to why we do these measurements. Um, I, I get a lot of questions at, uh, at CME courses or just through email from people saying, hey, how should I do these? Uh, how should I do liver fat quantification and, and when would I do it? Um, and the when and why is, is very, very important. Um, you, we, uh, you know, we really run some risks if we just start throwing numbers around uh, that uh, that our referrers don't know what to do with. We we risk getting them frustrated and uh, and and looking silly. So I think we should be selective when we do these measurements and really have a clear idea of why we're doing them when we do them. So thank you all. So with that uh, very invaluable comment, I would actually like to conclude our session today. That was very informative and uh, very scientific and educational. Thank you very much, Dr. Bashir. Um, I would again uh, repeat my uh, personal opinion, which is uh, Dr. Bashir is one of the best, if not the best in this topic in the world. So uh, keep up doing the good work. You're saving patients' lives, Dr. Bashir. We appreciate that. And you guys be with us tomorrow. Tomorrow we having the successor, Bashir. So today we had Mustafa Bashir, tomorrow we have Bashir Tawuli. And he's going to talk a, a, about a very important topic as well. It's also a cutting edge, which is abbreviated MR protocols in surveillance of HECC. Uh, so stay with us. We now became one family. So you guys uh, should again show up tomorrow. And thank you very much.